Greetings, everybody, and welcome, welcome. Should be an interesting evening this evening because we have Shane from Blackland coming on soon. And so I hope you're all doing great. Let's have a little bit of shaverage. And today's shaverage thus far is just yingling, regular old yingling, which is no problem. Hello, everybody. D.E., Ali, Kim, hello. Splitting time, Santucci, uh, Robert. Hello, Robert. Dr. Johnny. Razor Company, hello, Jason. By the way, there will be two giveaways this evening from the Razor Company. One is $20 and one is $50. So thank you, Jason, Razor Company. Uh, hello, Mr. Yost, good to see you. The Opinionated Brit, hello, good to see you, sir. Maritime, hello. Blackland joined. Okay, let's let's bring Shane in. Why not? Let's just get right into it. Request that Shane, it'll be just a second here. While we do, I just want to let you guys know, because you've been following, Kim Gray, just a moment, Shane, welcome. Um, Kim Gray, as you know, had a procedure last week. She is recovering well. I just spoke to her earlier, so we're very, very happy about that. The procedure was a success, and she is uh, recovering well, so that is really uh, great to hear. Welcome, Shane, by the way. Hey, Howdy. How's it going this evening? Uh, let's see. Say it again. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Let me turn it up a little bit. A little bit low, but I can hear you. Now I can't. So that <laughs> can't hear you now. Go ahead. Try it again. Okay. Are you there now? Okay. Now say something. Sorry for the technical difficulties, folks. Shane is working on the audio, and I'll read through some stuff while he's... All right, ahead, Shane. Yeah, now, now I can hear you. Yeah, now AirPods I can suck. hear you. AirPods suck, man. They always give you trouble. Mine work right. well for me. It depends on well, what makes, device That makes one of us. <laughs> uh, everything I have, Apple works great. Except for sometimes I get Echo, but that's okay. I mean... Can you hear can Echo? Echo? Nah, you've talked about it, man. Okay, good. All good. Um, so you got some big stuff coming up. You've been busy since the last time we talked. Yeah, man, let's get into it. Um, happy Friday, so, by the way. I'm definitely yeah, happy off. Friday. I'm definitely off, so I need to kind of reset. So I just pour myself a little whiskey. So that's that. That's good. That's good. And by the way, folks, feel free to pop your questions down in there. Shane is never afraid to answer questions, even if they're a little prickly. He's not one of those folks that shies away from. Uh, no, I love just them. about anything. He, he rather likes it. So I want to ask um, one of the things I was thinking about the other day when I asked you on is I think a lot of us, including me, don't really understand fully what goes into developing an eraser at all and how much time, effort, money. What is that process like? Like you're starting, you're drawing, and then you're can you sort of give people an idea of how much goes into the development as a rate of a razor just generally, not the era. Cause we're going to talk about that, yeah. but yeah, we'll get into that just generally. Um, yeah. I mean, as you've noticed, like I don't develop as many new products as we used to. Um, reason being that uh, the higher up you go, the more stakes are in each one. And so now when we make a product, I expect it to be around for, you know, years, um, ideally. And that means that it has to be really good. But most important to me is it has to have intention. So I don't make a product that doesn't like move the needle forward in some way. And I think a lot of people are just making another DE and another DE. And yeah, like 50 people will buy that. And maybe it's really cool. Maybe it kind of has like a different twist. But the only razor that, you know, that we currently make that isn't really innovative is the Blackbird. Like the Blackbird is just it's a cool razor. It's a different take on a DE a little bit, but you know, not really. It's not really <laughs> like they don't really do that much. Um, it's definitely a unique shaving experience, but it's a subtle uniqueness. Whereas the Vector, the Saber, the Era are pushing things in a specific direction. So that's the first step is it has to be something worth doing to me. Um, so I, I won't make a product that doesn't move the needle. And there's a way to do that 
there's a lot of ways to innovate, right? Innovation doesn't have to be just design or production method. It can be price point or it can be availability or it can be service or something else. Like there's a lot of ways to innovate. So that's step one. Like the concept has to be worth doing. Um, for example, when we started making the, the Saber, I knew I wanted to make a gem razor because at that time there, I think Rockno maybe had their uh, gem for a minute, but there really wasn't very many on the market at all. Yeah, there you go. There she is. There's a Saber, by the way. And uh, we and Above the Tie came out with our gems kind of the same time. But when I was developing it, there wasn't any else on the market. So I was thinking about ways to, to do a gem and... The only way I would do it is if it solved problems that I think that gem razors will have. And that's like putting the post behind the blade. I think that's really dumb. Um, I think it like shifts the blade way too far forward, especially because the gem blade is so um, you know long or deep, depending on what you call that dimension. So when you put the post behind it, it just makes it like a shovel on the front. And I think that's terrible. Um, I think that a razor should be like well balanced over the handle. So for that razor, it was like, okay, if we're going to make a gem, it has to be worth making. It has to be really cool. So um, let's start there. And once I have a concept that I figure out how to make it work, then, you know, that itself takes a while. So for the Saber, I, was, I tried a bunch of different versions. We had stuff that was kind of one blade-like where the gem just kind of gets stuck in the back. Let me ask um, you for a minute. Are you, yeah. are you like sketching these out on a piece of paper first? Or are you just thinking about it, doing it on a computer, iPad? How's I that can't process draw, work? I can't you? draw for shit, right? So that Instagram post the other day, that's my photographer. Uh, <laughs> it's just super cool. But that's more to like create a sense of, of you know, it, it's, it's marketing, right? But um, no, I can't draw worth a damn. And actually the reason that I can't draw is why I taught myself CAD because I had like ideas and I wanted to, I wanted to bring them to fruition, but I couldn't get out of my head. And that's actually pretty frustrating. And I'm sure a lot of people feel that way where they have something they want to make. Maybe it's a product or a service or something, and it's, like, stuck up here, and they want to get that out. Um, and I realized, like, well, if I have to draw – if I have to teach myself how to draw, all I'm doing is drawing so that I can convert it to digital anyway. So I just taught myself CAD instead, which is a lot easier. And then, um, you know, there are – there are terrible sketches too. You know, I, I sit around and I play, but that's just to get in my mind. Like if I show them to you, you'd be like, what the hell is this? That mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so I play around with sketches and I do, a, I have a really, I, I have, I've gotten really good at visualizing how things work in my head. And so you can almost do like mental prototyping of like how a mechanism works. Like a simple mechanism like this. You can kind of like sit there and think, okay, will that work? And that's kind of how the saber came up. It was going through a bunch of kind of mental prototypes and some actual physical real world prototypes. And eventually I landed on the post design where we could shim that post down and get the blade centered over the handle. And uh, that, and so once you have the concept, you know, that's kind of step one. Step one is like a hundred steps. And then from there you just, it's not that hard to actually make it into reality. Um, once you have relationships with people who can make things and once you kind of understand the process of converting things from digital into real world, um, it's not, you know, terribly difficult, really. It takes time and it takes, like, the knowledge of how to how to take that product and how to apply, like, tolerances and allowances to the, um, you know, to the, to the design to make sure that it fits together well and price it out. But that stuff, like, not that hard. It's just kind of time. Um, so for me, the how many difficult... Yeah, go ahead. How many versions would you say of razors you made of of the Sabre before you found one you settled on? Like, uh, is there a lot of, I wouldn't necessarily call it failure because when you're developing things, you're going to expect a certain amount. But did you go through multiple iterations before you were happy? So the, the further along we get, the more iterations we do. Um, the Blackbird is basically like prototype plus. And it's pretty much still that way today. Like it basically made a prototype. Yeah. And uh, it wound up just being really cool. So we went, great, let's just, let's go to market and figure it out. But as the stakes get higher and higher and as I have a reputation to protect and as I have um, customers that re rely on us to, to make good things and I know they're going to buy them immediately, um, like people will buy stuff that we make blind like if i put a black box on the website and called it 150 bucks and said razor a bunch of people would buy it so 
they aren't necessarily going to look at how well it's made at this point because they trust me. And so now I have to not betray that trust. And so now we do more and more iterations. Um, but with the Blackbird, it was like almost no iterations, you know, like a couple just screwing around at home to make it, um, you know, 3D printing, make it shave. The Sabre was more than that, uh, more iterations than that. But the real, the real thing about the Sabre was figuring out how to get the post right, how to make it assemble well, and how to make it so that the blade um, touches the post and the blade guards and the blade pins are kind of all at the same time without it binding up. But the shave itself is actually like not that difficult to get, right? Um, I mean, right. as much as like razor makers like me would like to make like lie and make you think it's difficult, it's really easy to make a thing that shaves well. It's a stick that holds a blade. Um, and there's only so many things I, you can play with to, to change I'm it. I'm so glad that you said that and your candor is very, very much appreciated because it's, it's hard to find somebody who's in the business who will say, yeah, it's a blade on a stick because uh, these are things that a lot of times we say is, hey, if you can have access to that blade and something holds it in there for you, then you can shave. And so, yeah, yeah. It, I, I do appreciate that sort of candor because it's uncommon, I would say. I mean, yeah, we're kidding ourselves when we say it's not. Like, shaving is not that difficult. Um, Correct. Now, the the way the stick holds a blade makes it easier or harder to shave. Mm -hmm. um, so it matters, but it's not that difficult to figure out. Like, the difficulty in all this stuff is having the capital, storing the things, managing the business. Like, that's the real difficulty. Um, well, once you get step one done. Step one is the design has to be worth a damn. And then once you have that, it's all, like, business stuff. And um, and that's that's the hard part, but the actual production isn't that difficult. You know, we have 3D printing now. Um, well, the entire time that Blackline's been around, everything just gets desktop 3D, 3D printed. So... You know, it's made, it's practically free, um, and you just sit there and play around and iterate all day long. And so you can push things really far without having to even you know um, turn a single handle on a lathe. Like you can get a design really advanced without ever having to to machine a single thing. So I've got to ask you about how long did it take you to get a return on your investment? Because you've got a lot of stock. You've, you've got materials you've got machining you've got all your designs and iterations all the people you're paying does it take quite a bit of time selling these before you've actually been made even no um i mean a little bit more now but not really because for the for the blackbird and the saber which are the first two designs we made um basically you know, not very much money. I, I started the company with 4,500 bucks, I think. Wow. And all of that was for like eight Blackbird prototypes or something like that. And the, the uh, that was like four grand of it. And like 500 was like make an LLC, have a crappy website. Um, and like get some business cards or something that I never used. And then it's just iterating um, for that one. It's just, you know, I have 3D printed it a bunch. So you spend, you know, a couple hundred bucks, a few hundred bucks, just outsourcing 3D printing before I had a 3D printer. Now I have them. I still outsource to more advanced 3D printing. You get better, um, you have a better granularity. You get more accurate prints. So I still do that. I start with desktop printers that I have, and then we kind of go from there. But it doesn't take long to recoup an investment because, you know, that 4,500 bucks, that, that's really quickly uh, eaten up by by raises and what's really nice is that we are by sales sorry and the the key now is we have really good credit terms with our manufacturers so you know when we produce we don't have to hang on to hundreds of razors and sitting in my pocket because um that's costly that's difficult what we do now is basically it's called like a blanket order where we say like hey let's produce a massive amount that's going to last us um ideally like a year-ish. This year is different, so we'll put that on hold because this year has been massive production issues because of COVID stuff. But ideally, you, we, because we worked with the same manufacturer for five or six years, the entire time the business has been around, we um, have really good credit terms. And so what we can do is say, hey, let's make like a year's worth. And we're going to order a year's worth. I don't have to buy it, but I'm going to get the benefit of scale. So I'm going to get the economy of scale. I'm going to get a better price point because I'm ordering thousands instead of 100 for this month. 
and allows the manufacturer to produce kind of at will. So they can kind of squeeze it into their schedule. So if you're going to say you want to make, I don't know, say, let's just say the order is like a thousand. Um, and I need 200 up front or something like that, right? These aren't real numbers, but it's even numbers. So I can say, hey, make a thousand. I'll get 200 up front. You spend, you get the rest over the next several months. Whenever you have time, if you, that way you can squeeze it in their schedule. So I benefit that I don't have to buy everything up front and I get the benefit of having the larger quantity, better price point per unit. They get the benefit of having the flexibility to just squeeze it into an opening. So they don't have to push other people out of the way. They can schedule all their other jobs and they can run their jobs and then they just put us in where they have space. So it benefits everyone. And that means that basically it's profitable from like day one, a product is. So I do have a like question this. because this, this is probably the comment or question I get the most with respect to Blackland. And it is, of course, about the vector. And there are so yeah. many people out there that at least – I'm taking them at their word in comments that they really want a, a stainless vector or some people titanium as well. Um, and they're like, why can't I get my hands on the vector they want? And for good reason, because, you know, I've said it many times. I'll say it again. This is one of my all time favorite razors. It's my favorite single edge razor, period. It's the best one ever made for me. I like it that much. It's so sleek and nimble and it's really unlike anything else. There are other really good, artist club style razors like this, but um, it's, I like it so much that people will constantly say, how did that razor compare to the vector? I said, we don't talk about that because it doesn't compare to the vector because yeah. this one is in a league of its own in terms of the way it feels and maneuvers other than the, the knockoff copies, which obviously are going to be similar because they're copies, but any other sure. razor, there's nothing really like it original or anything that's built in this fashion that isn't a copy. And so I say, well, I'll have to compare that against another razor of its type because typically they're more heavy, they're more cumbersome, they're larger in the head. That's the main yeah, that's why distinction. This mm -hmm. And this one, of course, is super, super sleek. And the handle, um, everything fits. It just works the way it is. And so that's a long, long-winded way of saying when can people get their hands on these vectors? Um, yeah, so first, thank you for that. The vector is definitely the best razor remake probably overall um like if someone just had to pick a ran a razor you would just say just get a vector there's good reasons to get the razors for sure and people have individual preferences but as far as just a product it's definitely the best one we have um we are we should have them by the end of the year um as people know this year has been a super challenging business year production has been awful um you know somehow we've still managed to increase sales by quite a bit but like, if you look at our website, we're cleaned out so much. We're finally kind of getting through that. For people who don't know, basically there's just been, there's a, basically a pinch from both sides of the supply and demand curve. Everyone like me has seen our demand go up. So we're rushing to admit to production, rushing to manufacturers. Manufacturers are having issues, are getting, so they're getting more demand and they're also having supply issues. They're having uh, raw materials issues. They're having issues getting, um, uh, sorry, getting machines. So like our manufacturers are trying to expand. Well, okay, great. So let's just buy a bunch more, uh, a bunch of mills to machine more stuff. Well, it's going to take six, nine months. So it's hard to scale up. And like earlier in the year, in the spring, it was really rough um, where usually our raw materials would be quoted. You know, you could have them for, I think like 30 days. So you go and say, hey, I want to buy a bunch of brass. And they say, okay, here's a price. And it's good for 30 days. As this year started, it got down to like 15 and then it was seven days and then it was two days and then it was 24 hour quote. Then it was, wow, it's, it's, it's good for right now. Like there's a, these prices are fluctuating this much is what you're saying. It, it was in March, April ish, if I remember right, maybe February of this year. Um, so they, there was a point where it got down to our raw, our raw material suppliers. And I should be clear that our manufacturers manage this, but it impacts us obviously where the quotes were good for right now. So if you buy now, they're good. Otherwise, they're subject to change. You have to come back and request another quote. So it got to the point where, like, you get a – like, there was one time where they got a quote in the afternoon, and by the time they could act on it in the morning, the quote had gone up, I think, 18%. Wow. Um, from, you know, 12 hours or whatever. 
yeah, so super rough. Um, anyway, it, it's been a hell of a year, but we're finally getting through that. Things are finally getting better. Um, we have a ton of production lined up, so everything's been coming back. Um, the so right, right right now we're finishing up um, stainless steel blackbirds to keep those in stock. They haven't sold out, and they're not going to. So those are uh, wrapping up production now, or you know wrapping up that part of production we talked about before with these blanket orders, where we have enough. And then um, blackbird titanium is up next because it makes sense to go from blackbird to blackbird titanium somewhere set up. And then is this because be the machines are already configured and ready to make them or? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a very similar setup, right? So you have like tooling to hold all the parts mm -hmm. and, or the blanks to machine the parts. And, you know, when you think about when you should machine a top cap, you would machine from one side and then you have to flip it over and machine the other side. So that's like a fixturing thing, right? So you can think of machining the bottom side of the top cap where the thread is you know, out of like a blank, uh, you know, a cube. And then you take that and like a lot of, a lot of manufacturers will like basically um, have a bolt on the other side of that. So they can bolt down now using the thread itself that they just machined to do the other side. So having those fixtures apply to both stainless and titanium. Like not all the program settings work the same because there's different like speeds and feeds for titanium versus stainless, but it's a lot quicker. So it just makes sense to, swip, to switch to similar models. Um, so anyway, after black for titanium is done, then we'll be on to the vector stainless steel, and that'll be here, you know, this year at some point. Good. That, that's then, a question I get yep. a lot. And me, me too. Again, <laughs> me too. I imagine so. I yeah. Imagine so. I. Uh, yeah, it's gonna go be. Ahead. It's gonna be. Uh, I don't know. It's gonna be wild. I'm kind of scared for when the vector comes back in stock, because we have like wholesale um, retailers knocking at our door. Oh, big. Yeah. They're putting more pressure on us than uh, than customers are. So I guess customers are calling them a lot. They are. <laughs> they. I, I had a question just today. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, we can't ignore this because this is kind of a big deal. And it is, of course, the the era. Yeah. And here's the, the packaging. And um, I did use this this morning already. Cool. And it was good. I'll talk a little bit about it. But nice. um, the packaging on this is nice because it has a nice little magnetic Satis there's something nice about magnets. I don't know. It's just kind of cool. Closes nicely. And inside, of course, is the era. And this little box here holds plates, which, which is very cool. And there's a little note here that talks about the razor and the way it's made, which is 3D printed and CNC machined. And we'll ask Shane to explain that in just a moment. But... Um, it's, it's very exciting, and I will ask you about price point and expectations and all. Um, it's really exciting to me because this is really an innovative product. Like, it's nothing that I know of in this space has ever been made via this method and sold. Yeah. And so it's it's really, really... Um, so it's actually even more than that. So it's the okay. only uh, product like it at all. Um, so it's, it's, as far as we can tell, it's the first, like, you know, mass produced 3d printed consumer good of metal. Um, there are things like this buried in other components, right? Like there's like 3do our, our contract manufacturer works a lot with firearms and stuff like that. And so there are 3d printed components, metal 3d printed components in consumer goods. But as far as we're aware, nothing that is like the end use is, primarily 3D printed um, in this way. And that's mass produced. So we're pretty excited about that. Like Charcoal Goods made a razor a few years ago using um, a different kind of uh, metal manufacturing, which is cool. If you remember that, you did a 3D printing um, with what's called like SLS, which is selective laser centering, um, which is cool. It's not quite as capable as our, our method. It's better for like small scale. Um, but yeah, so we're super excited about that. And uh, the packaging that you had, I'm, I'm really excited over because it's really easy to make a box when you have like a $200 price point, but that's really cool. People can't tell that all is like soft touch paper, paper. It's really well made. Um, it's actually made right here in San Diego, completely custom um, from top to bottom. And to get that into like a really good price point is difficult and uh, super happy with how that turned out. So I, yeah, I we want to like have that because it's, yeah, it's it not be overdone, present, but it's nice. You know, and yeah. it's, it's, it has a good sort of get it. And you're like, Hey, this is cool. Right. You know, it, at this price point, 
our margins aren't massive, and so we have to find ways to save, and we have to save on on packaging. But you, we didn't want to compromise, so we were able to be clever without compromising, like where it's made, or the way it feels, or the fact that it's functional. So we were able to uh, just be just be clever and save money that way instead of having to like outsource it to China or whatever, or use super inferior materials. It's all actually one piece it's all paper and it's like one giant piece <laughs> what, what are we laughing at shady says i love my package to look awesome for when i throw it out nice you should have said whip it out um <laughs> yeah yeah you should have um <laughs> let me really quick i'm going to do a quick giveaway for the razor company so this is for a 20 dollars gift card courtesy of the razor company and the question is uh jason at the razor company just the other day put up a sort of special release that's coming back from Noble Otter. The first person to name it shall be the winner. Jason just put it up like a day or two ago, coming back from Noble Otter, has been out stock for a long time, and I wait to see, nope, it's not Vespers, Firefighter, so mostly vintage head shaver. Oh, Lord Shady said Neon Sun, get out of here. Um, mostly vintage head shaver, you're the winner, so DM me here your email address and name and i'll get that over to shane or not shane i'll take it too. get that get that over to jason and so he will get that to you so i want to ask so we talked about this before this is this involves 3d printing and cnc machining and this is stainless steel so roughly and i know we did it the last time but there's a lot of people that still don't know what is that like like how do you 3d print stainless steel that's nuts like a lot of people yeah. even people today were like what did you say 3d printed so a lot of the issues here is like verbiage terminology calling it 3d printing is true but there's so many different types of 3d printing you know more broadly like additive manufacturing that there's just not a good language to describe how it works yet um the way this process works is well maybe it's, it's real Real quick, we can talk about what most people think of when they think of 3D printing. Okay, yeah. Like a basic, you know, the plastic ones that everyone, well, not everyone, but a lot of people like uh, like me have at their home. Um, basically, all that is is um, you have a, a bed, and then you have, like, a little nozzle that squeezes plastic through it, and just hot plastic. And so you basically just, like, just draw stuff. So it squeezes the hot plastic out. Once it lands on the bed, it kind of sticks to the bed, but cools off and becomes hard. And then you just stack on top of it. So if you wanted to make the cylinder, you would just draw a circle and then you would go up the, the height of uh, the plastic you just deposited, draw another circle on top of it and go up and up and up and up. Just kind of like laying bricks, but it's just one continuous brick you're laying. Mm -hmm. so that's what most people think of when they think of 3D printing. And that's not how we do it at all. Um, there's another version of metal printing that's much more common you can go on shapeways right now and you can like give them a, a part and they'll make it i'm sorry shady said it's <laughs> no, okay. made of pot metal <laughs> continue i'm sorry so um the the other way of metal 3d printing is it's called like sls and basically there's like a powder um a bed full of metal powder kind of like what's in um mim razor like a rockwell success is made with this way and a laser comes in, zaps it, it binds together, and then you do the same thing. You go up and up and up. What we do is a combination of, of MIM, which is like the stuff that the Rockwell success and the Supply V2 is made out of, or the stainless version of Supply V2. And a lot of other tools are made that way. It's a combination of that, it's a combination of 3D printing, and it's a combination of CNC. So the way it works is, um, this, by the way, this process is all innovated by a company called 3DO out of uh, mm -hmm. Los Angeles. That we work with basically what they are they're super clever they have a really good hybrid um process they lay down a bed of that mim powder the same stuff that goes in the rockwell six, success and whatever that's 17 four stainless stress so you lay down a layer of that and then it gets basically hosed down with a called a binding agent kind of like wetting sand it keeps it together keeps it nice and firm um not hard metal yet but it just combine it just holds all of that loose metal powder in place and now it's kind of rigid and hard. Now, at this point, there's, I think, six or eight in the most recent um, version. They're constantly updating their machines. There's six or eight just regular CNC mills. And those are basically like drill bits that sit up here. They drop down, 
almost like a router and they cut an outline into that. So you actually, you have additive manufacturing and the fact that you're adding that metal powder and then you're doing subtractive manufacturing like machining just to cut an outline. And you're basically using almost like the way you cut plywood. If you want to make like a plywood pyramid, you would cut a bunch of squares and smaller size. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing here. So you lay down a, you lay down a layer, you um, wet it down effectively, binding agent, cut out an outline, and then do it again and again and again. And so then what you wind up with is the the bed, the build volume, is this rigid cake of all that bound metal that's also cut out in the middle. Your parts, your parts are in there hiding. This is called the cake. They take that, it's rigid, and it gets broken out. And now you have these parts that are basically like if you take um, – the Rockwell success, those MIM razors, they go in a, they do the same process, but they do it in a mold. So pretty much the exact same thing happens for them, except instead of being 3D printed, that material just goes into a mold where that process happens. And we're basically building the mold almost, or building the part directly instead of molding it. Now the part's oversized because um, they need to be centered. So there's like binding agent in there and there's airspace and stuff like that. So basically now it goes into a centering oven and the binding agent falls out of the mix. So then you're left with just metal um, particles and they fuse together under the intensity of the, the furnace. Um, and so then you pull that out, the parts shrink like 18-ish percent, I think around 20%. Um, non, not predictably, by the way, but uh, not equally in all dimensions. And then you have the final part. Now it's hard metal. Now you actually have like a, a solid metal part. Then we take it, um, because there's always a little bit of warping when, during the shrinking process. It's really hard to predict that just right. So then we do some post-processing machining to kind of clean up some of the important parts that are critical to the shave geometry, like the top of the safety bar, the, um, the, uh, like the overhang where the blade mounts, that kind of, those, those surfaces get really quickly um, flattened out. Just make sure they're perfectly flat so we have really consistent shaving. And then you kind of get the best of all worlds. And then we do a, uh, like a bead blasted finish on it and passivation. And then it comes here. And uh, well, that's basically how it works, <laughs> I guess. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that, that's it. Uh, so I was going to say, one of, does that make one of the things. Final product? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was trying to read the question. One of the things I like about this, uh, I was noticing, and I'm sorry, I forgot to bring it in here, is for the stand, you've chosen have that hollowed out and it just sits on the stand very nicely i like that design because you're not putting the razor down in something yeah. because you can if you're not careful scrape up with some of the stands and so i For like sure. this design choice a lot in that regard it fits in there very nice and just rides there very nicely yeah. i was looking at this there's no rough edges on it it is very precisely um it's very precisely made the teeth everything yes just and looking if, at it. And if it. you look closely, like it's very, you know, it becomes obvious. It's, it's, it's a tool. It's a bit more industrial than like yes, a super yes. finished uh, $200 razor. And, um, you know, and that's kind of intentional. That's just how it is. Like there is a point where, and if you also look really close, especially on the open comb teeth, you can see a couple of areas where it's like, oh, this is 3D printed. You can kind of tell like some layer lines occasionally. Um, at first glance, especially the safety bars, it's kind of hard to tell how it's made. Like it's not obvious. Um, right which I think is really, just really cool. And if you look carefully, you can tell. And over time, we will be basically getting rid of those layer lines entirely um, as the technology advances. Because right now, effectively what we're doing, like I said, we're cutting it just in two dimensions. You're cutting an outline, you move up, cut an outline. Um, what we'll be able to do next is basically profile those three-dimensional um, surfaces by cutting at an angle like a three or five axis mill would, or sorry, a four or five axis mill would do. So instead of just cutting straight down, like a router, we'll be able to cut to the side and then get rid of those layer lines entirely. So that'd be kind of next, but um, but for now, I think it's cool to show off a little bit of 3D printing, kind of show off how it's made. And I love that personally. So one of the things I was thinking about today when I was using this, and that video will be up tomorrow, um, this could be an every man's razor, sort of in the realm of Rockwell, even though it's not the same as Rockwell. It's not made the same. It's not remotely the same in that regard. But yeah. for me, when I was using this, I thought it would be hard 
to find somebody who's offended by it. Now, I, of course, went straight to five. But I thought even on five, it was very, very smooth without yeah. being overly. So for me, I think the Blackbird right out of the box is a little more efficient than this even on five for me. Yep. But this one was very nice, very smooth. And I thought, I think this is going to appeal to a very wide swath of users who, because some people want it very mild. And I'm certain that those, you know, one or two or whatever, they're probably going to hit the mark. And then- yep. If you want some blade feel without it being rough, um, you know, you can go up and yep. everything worked out. It just, it felt right. Good. Um, and I thought it's a really nice uh, um, razor. Now, so what is the price point expected to be? Uh, yeah, so this would be 75 bucks um, for a razor with one base plate okay. and um, it'll go up from there. Base plate pricing is in the works but we're, it will probably look like it's going to be in the 30s per base plate, hopefully low 30s, as low as possible. The reality, though, is that the base plate is kind of where all the magic is. It's the most complicated part to print. It's the most expensive part to make. And it's where all of the kind of, like, market differentiation comes in. Like, the ability for the blade to clamp, like, right at the edge with that big overhang, which I'm sure you noticed. Um, and, like, the the way to make it not clog is all in the base plate. So a lot of like the makes the era, the era is in the base plate. Um, so we would like to make that uh, cheaper in the future, but right now it's going to be like in the low mid thirties, probably what we're looking for. But yeah, I mean, your answer or your, um, your statement about the, uh, the black being more efficient is definitely true. The era is not designed to be like a, a super efficient razor for the pros, right. For the, for the best shavers It's meant to be something that, everyone can use because all of our razors are pretty kind of like elitist a little bit where they have like a lot of blade feel and people feel intimidated by them. But the, let's be like really clear the era is meant to be a razor for the masses. It's meant to be a product that sells really well. And it's meant to be something that is liked by a lot of people and doesn't just appeal to the guys who want the most insane thing. Cause the reality is that, well, that the people, that's what I said. Most, I thought it, yeah, it could very well be in every man's right. Like somebody, the razor that anybody could use comfortably, even if you do find yourself wanting more, I found it was still, I called it, yeah. and I was just guessing, and this is very, very subjective, 5.5, .5, you know, maybe out of 10, maybe six, if you're pushing it. Um, but for me, it was really, really, what I noticed the most, and if I had to describe it in one word, I'd say smooth, because yeah. I didn't feel anything rough, and you never should when you're using any razor, but some razors that have a design to, to give you a lot of blade feel, depending on the way you use it, it can come across rough. And this one did not offer any sort of roughness, but it did an excellent job. So, so I thought when I used it, the first thing that came to mind was Rockwell, a, a razor that um, most people don't find to be offensive in any way and many people can use it and it has a good price point. And that's the idea. And, um, you know, I've also noticed that the, the area is a little bit deceptive because the, the blade is clamped like really, really well, extremely well. It's about as close to the edge as you can physically get, which is really cool. And that makes it shave and feel milder than it is from an efficiency standpoint in my opinion like i have a you know i have a thick beard um, yeah and i'm a i'm a blackbird guy right i designed the blackbird for me but i use the era on level three usually and it's enough to get a really close comfortable shave and um you don't get much blade feel but it's efficient enough and i think that's the sweet spot because we still have th there's the other logical reason is that when you start naming base plates you have the issue where like, what if we need to make something more mild? We can't have like negative one. So right. if, if, if by making it a little more mild, we give ourselves ability to add on later if we need to. So like, I, instead of working backwards, the, you can go the other direction, which is cool. One of the choices I, I like too, design wise, you probably, it's probably hard to see here, but you've got the numbers also on both sides of the plate, which I don't yeah. know if I've seen that before. I like it because no matter how you grab this plate, if it's laying down or if you have multiple, you know it from either the top or the bottom that you have plate number one. It's very, very easy to identify. So I like that. That was a good, uh, I, 
I noticed that immediately. I was like, hey. What's also, what's so, also kind of neat, Chris, is if you um, if you ever get a chance, it's like you can stack the base plates on each other. I don't know if you've noticed that yet. It's really cool. They they nest in each other perfectly, so you can have like a little stack of them, which I, I think is kind of fun. Um, I have not nested them. But yeah, do it. It's I fun. Try. Yeah, it's nice to store them. And because they're not, you know, super like polished finish, you're not going to really mess them up too much, which is kind of nice. It's not super like, um, it's not a very precious razor, which I wish it would be So this is meant to be, you know, this is what a razor essentially is supposed to be to begin with, which is to use, you know. Yeah. Now that said, there is something nice. And I try to explain this to people because some people, oh, yeah, they, wow. That's cool, right? I had to do it. Yeah, they fun. do nest perfectly like when you yeah. set them down there that's pretty cool yeah it does it feels feels like you're almost that's just uh, happenstance because of the way well one i want to make a really thin head i think thin and um um agile is really nice i so you, you know, see kinda, it almost yeah, looks like there's one hole and one slot and those are two plates there so that means they're very precisely yeah made. it's cool so we wanted to make it as thin as possible for two reasons. One, um, thin is just thin is in. You know, I like it. I like it when they're agile. I don't want a big monster head. I think people are moving past that a little bit. The that other is a reason, low profile head. Yeah. The other reason is that it the whole game of manufacturing this style is um, fitting as many things as you can into the build volume. That's how you get your economies of scale. Because the entire that entire build area that we talked about, where we make that cake and we add all the metal powder, you, that takes just about the same amount of time, whether you have one part in it or 500. So you benefit from squeezing as much in there as possible. So the reason those nest is because that's kind of how they're printed, is they print it like nested, basically. So you can squeeze them in there. And it has the benefit of being cool. No, go ahead. I have, I have a question. Uh, this was another one because we can't forget our good friends in Europe and all over South America oh, abroad. Yeah. Um, they want to know if at some point down the road, this razor will also be made available to vendors who want to sell it outside the United States. That was immediately a question today because we have a lot of folks, particularly yeah. in Europe, but not only Europe. Yeah, the answer is um, definitely yes. I don't know exactly what that looks like. The... Um, it kind of depends on, it may not be available as like an individual razor per se. It might be like the level two through four kit or something, you know, or it might be some sort of bundle to make it, um, to make it feasible from a financial perspective. I don't yeah, exactly I like know what bundle. that looks like yet. That makes it a bit easier. It's also difficult for the retailer where, you know, a razor like this, you have 10 different basement options. And so for a retailer, that's 10 different SKUs effectively they could buy, right? Because you, you don't expect the retailer to be in the game of assembling stuff when you give it to them. So you don't just give them a pile of top caps, handles, and base plates and say, like, make razors, good luck. You give them razors. So it makes it difficult from, from their side to figure out, like, okay, well, do we have to buy 10 of every type and then have 100? Like, how do they do that? So we'll probably be doing something, some sort of like bundle type deal for them, especially internationally. And it helps our margins, helps make things easier for them. And ultimately people can still buy internationally direct from us if they want to just get like the basic product. That's probably what it'll look when like. Are, when are you shooting or do you have any dates in mind or you're still ramping May. up production? Say that again? May. No, I'm just kidding. May? Okay. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. May, May was May was last time, remember? Um that's True. what we called for it last fall. No, uh, last spring. No, um, this year. There, we're like deep into production. Well, that's um, not bad because we're already in near November. So Yeah. So I think I, we may have talked about this last time, but for this launch, we're doing, uh, we're doing basically what's called like, we're calling it like a soft launch, or I'm calling it a soft launch. So what's cool about this production technique is that we can scale – really well we can get up to like thousands of raises a month if you want it's monthly production which is really nice so that means that um we can use like we can use data from this month say we have this month's sales we can go okay well, that went well that means in two months from now let's ramp up production 15 20 percent and so we can kind of move on the fly which is really helpful for keeping things in stock but because we haven't made a raise this way no one has and 
we haven't sold something that's kind of mass produced in this way. So, because this should be, unless we just really screw up, which is totally possible, this should be our um, highest selling product in terms of numbers, at least. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that we can get all the kinks ironed out from a production standpoint, because no one's made a race like this. I want to make sure that we iron things out from a fulfillment perspective, because we've never made a product at scale like this. So we're basically artificially limiting production for the first three months and ramping it up each month. Um, so the first month we'll have just a, a few hundred razors available, and then it'll be a bit more next month and a bit more after that. So there will be limited availability for the first few months. Um, they'll probably sell out at least month one, probably sell out pretty quickly. And then it will become increasingly available and we'll kind of roll into it until like middle of Q1. And then we'll be, then we can eventually open the floodgates and make pretty much as many as we can sell. I could be wrong on this, but I'm expecting that initial demand will be pretty robust because I know a lot of people have expressed interest. Sometimes they express interest and they don't actually buy it, but a lot of people seem to have interest in this. So, you know, I hope, uh, hope you were able to get quite a few on that first run. At least a lot of people have commented on this one. Uh, of course they do. Yeah. Once you get, once something goes away, then they always want it. If you guys, it's exactly guys what happened it. to me. Yeah. It's exactly what happened to me. Cause I had this one in non-polished and then mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? I have the blackbird. It's kind of duplicative. Do I really need to keep it? And then I got rid of it. And then I was like, Oh man, I'd like to have that back now. And so, I found this one for an excellent price and I snatched it up and it's not going anywhere. You know, and this is the dart by the way, which he doesn't make anymore. Yeah. I love that thing. No, it's classic. You know, as soon as we get rid of it, everyone's like, Oh, where's the dart? I love the dart. And there's plenty of people that I didn't hear it said, where's the dart? And I'm like, wow, it's it's a, um, even myself, like I said, well, I got the blackboard. Do I really need? And, and then once I got rid of it and I saw this one, I was like, I'm going to get that. I want that. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it makes me laugh every time. It's just like, you know, you, people always want what they can't have. Like as soon as we, no one bought the dart, that's why it's dead. And then as soon as we get rid of it, everyone freaked out. Where's the dart? <laughs> like, like, I don't, I don't know why you care so much if you didn't buy it when you could have. You, you could have bought it know. for not you personally. Think, you could have, you guys could have bought it for the last three years. But I, you know, one of the things like, that happens is when people know things are around they'll sort of put it off. So they're like, yep. I'm going to get, I, I'm going to get that. It's on my list. And then something else comes up. That's a little, you know, I got to have that right now. And so they're always sure. like, I'll go back and get it. It happens all the time. Yep. No, I get it. I mean, I do this exact same thing without a sense of urgency. You know why? Um, plus the dart just had, you know, really crazy reviews are all over the place and no one could ever it's, put a finger on like what it was. Is it aggressive? Is it mild? Efficient. I don't know. I think it was a fish yeah. like, for me. Like, yeah. I, no, I, it's, you know, I love it. I think it's cool. Um, but I also don't like, there are no sacred cows here, right? This, this has to make money and things. Basically sure. they either carry their own weight or they die. And that's it's like, as simple as that. It, it couldn't um, make the cut essentially to me. Yeah, you know the blackbird is is so good. I was like, okay, do, do I really need the other? And eventually, the answer was, no, I don't need it, but I want it. Sure. Um, but I felt having two that were similar ish enough. I think that's issue. like okay. Yeah, I can make a I can make a choice. Now I will say, um, with the vector, it's like if you made slight iterations of the vector, I probably get them all because I bought that open plate, uh, open comb not too yeah. long ago. I love it. I love the regular one. And I'm like, this is just, you know, of course I'm a vector fan. So I mean, I don't make any excuses for that. I just like it. So I think yeah, the well, only one I haven't tried that you've made, although I did try, I own two of the original Tradaris and I let them go. Uh, I think I haven't tried your version, but I think I've, I think I've tried everything same. else that you've made. Yeah. It's the same. I mean, that's the whole point. Um, which, by the way, uh, the Tradere safety bar will be in stock tomorrow for everyone else out there. Not okay. for long. It's just a small amount so that we have. Sign and up then... for the newsletter, by the way. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's the way you, you learn things. I'm going to do another quick video uh, giveaway, and then we're going to get to sure. the questions because uh, there's quite a few questions in there. Um, again, courtesy of the Razor Company, uh, he just put up a new offering from Lothar. 
what is the name of that offering? And the first one I see that gets it right will be 50 big dollars, almost enough to buy an era. So that's pretty good. Let's see. Waiting for the comments. Yep, it is. N names like that are really hard. <laughs> I-X-I-E-R-I-K. Ixeric. I don't know what. But this is Eric. Uh, I-X-I. DM yep. me your email address, and uh, I will shoot that over. So that was, it was Nanka, was, or I don't even know how to say that, but that's what it was. You were right, but your name is very difficult to say. Somebody said Fougere Gothic. You don't want that, believe me. You don't want it. <laughs> but anyway, um, let's get to a couple of the questions here, or some of the questions. Phil Wetshave. Yeah. Wet shave. Okay, Phil. Is the finish better with the stainless steel 3D printing than with plastic? Um, so that's it looks like broad. it to me. Yeah, I mean, the answer is, is yes, but that's a really broad question because there's a lot of different types of plastic 3D printing. Uh, this is much better than like a desktop 3D printer where you're going to have thicker layer lines with lower, les lower resolution because, again, we're not really building it that way. Um, also, this is so the actually the top cap on the era, the outer surface is actually milled, it's machined as well. Um, that's just wound up being a bit more efficient, a bit more reliable. So the inner part is 3D printed and then the outside is machined and then bead blasted. So you actually get like a very identical to a machined finish on that part. And we get really consistent finish on everything else. And the handle is machine, um, you know, turned on a lathe traditional. And then we just bead blast to match as close as possible. So uh, better than plastic, I guess, probably. Yeah. Raza asks, any plans for making an injector style eraser? Well, I want to hit that guitar question real quick. I don't play left-handed guitar. That's just the mirror of the camera. It's a right-handed guitar, but I am left-handed, so it's a valid question. Um, will we make an injector? Yeah, so it, depending on how the era goes, we have some plans for era-style things made of that um, method 3D printing. So there might be like an era, I don't know if it will be called this, but like an era vector, right, um, where we take the similar principles and apply it to um, a vector-style razor or an artist club mm. razor. Interesting. And um, an injector is on the table for that as well. But neither oh, of which are, are locked in, but it's on the, yeah. um, it's definitely At it's least it's on the table. Yeah, it all depends on how, on how the other goes. So if you want, I guess the answer is if you want an injector, you go buy the era because that will be more likely to make the injector eventually. So he wants to know the higher plate, um, how oh, it works with the R41. Yeah. Um, yeah, less less efficient. And it also depends on which R41 and you're talking less, about. Yeah, definitely way less than the 2011. Um, still less aggressive than 2013. M efficient enough for most people, most normal people, um, but not definitely not at all harsh, not a ton of blade feel. It's more traditional than the Blackbird in that it just kind of has a wider blade gap, but not a ton of blade feel. Gotcha. What's the best way to get notifications on product releases? So, for example, when you newsletter, when you restock. Yeah, newsletter for sure. Um, we're gonna be getting a, so you can sign up for newsletter in the footer of our website. Um, also, just follow on social media. We're pretty good about um, giving announcements ahead of time. So we never throw it on people last minute. It's always several days in advance at an exact time. We know exactly where you'll need to be. Um, we'll be also having a, a new website drop the next week-ish, I hope. Um, and that will be a lot more functional. And I'm not sure if we'll be there at release, but we'll have like an SMS thing as well. So you can get like text messages and stuff like that eventually too. Oh, cool. Uh, what handle lengths will be available? Presumably, I'm, I, I think he means yeah. talking about the era. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's 90 millimeters. I think it might be 92. Oh man, I forget, but I think it's 90. Um, which is like three inches-ish. Maybe three and a Which half. do you prefer, open comb or the other, generally? Safety bar. Yeah, you do. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't know. I tried the open comb first. I don't know. There's just something about open comb. That... Open comb are, are are very cool, and I think if you want the most aggressive, efficient experience, which is probably best for you, then that's probably the way to go. But um, the safety bar is just really smooth, and actually on this razor, because of the way the the undercut and overhang works, you'll find out when you use the safety bar, you can't clog it. Like, it is awesome. It just it flows forever, and it's really cool. Um, there's also, for people who don't know, the Air also comes with kind of cool like grip rings. So if you can snap them onto the uh, cutout indents on the handle, if you need a luster grip, because I know some people don't like the cylindrical handles, that gives you a little extra. They're like silicone grip rings. It gives you a little extra yeah. uh, squeeze, which is nice. I, d- I either overlooked them or I haven't gotten to them yet. So it's probably They're in me. Yeah, probably just... Well, you have, yeah, like, long, you have the party pack, right? So you have everything. Yeah. Um, and there's like a, a bunch of boxes and stuff but i think those yeah they're in the there. they're in the um they're in the one that has the blades in it which is the like gotcha. the one inside the main box i will find those because i did not uh, <laughs> they're cool i i didn't i was so anxious to use it i was just like let's get it let's get it underway you know? um, <laughs> that guy said he also comes with grip rings <laughs> cute <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a shady thing any plans yeah. to create a straight razor no uh, i can't I can't, if we did it, we'd have to obviously partner with somebody who actually does blades and then I would just design it and make it cool. And then we'd figure out how to make a neat scale design, which I've you know thought about, but that's not our core competency and it's not super important to me. So probably no. What market research do you undertake regarding new products? The main thing is that I've been in the market for six years. So that's step one. So like every day is market research. Um, it doesn't necessarily feel that way, but you know, examining the market every single day just by hanging out in forums and hanging out on social media and whatever, you really get a sense for it. Like you guys all have really good market research. You know what's available. You know what people like, you know what people don't like. And then the next step is not believing fans, like respectfully, but fans right. always want you to do what you're currently doing, which is why they're your fan. Um, so that's the next thing is kind of knowing when to listen and when to not listen. That's kind of the, the difficult part. Are you more bullish or less bullish on the underlying printing technology now versus a year ago? That's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, the answer is if I step back more bullish um, on a day-to-day basis, I'm a little bit jaded just because it's taking so long and it's frustrating. But I'm extremely happy with the product, and I do believe that it's the future, but it's just been such a pain in the ass to get it there that on a personal level, I'm kind of like, God, it sucks. Um, but the process is great. I like the people doing it, and I think it's, I think it's great. So Marion, he says, do you know the Muffin Man like a <laughs> oh. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Phil. Oh, man, Marion. Oh, goodness. Uh, I polish every razor I get. Will this be able to be polished? I don't know about this one. Yeah, you can polish it. Um, can you? Yeah. yeah, so we actually have really good. So compared to um, MIM or MIM razors, we actually have better densities, better part densities than they do. So we get part densities somewhere around like 99% So of billet. Say billet is 100% you know, dense. It's not, but if we compare it to that, that's the benchmark. We get like 98 to 99%. MIM is like the 96 or 7% range. Um, for what we're talking about here, it doesn't matter, but the denser you are, the more metal you have and the better polish you can get. So you, we, I polished a few. You can get pretty good polish. You don't get quite as good as you get with Billet um, just because there's like a granularity to it, but you can get it really nice and shiny and it, it, it does pretty well. It says, will you ever offer any erasers in a bead blast finish besides the era? I don't know, probably not. Um, maybe I, I usually think that the blast finishes make things look a lot more industrial. And so they work on things that are more user grade. I don't think they work super well on, on higher end stuff. I think the machine finish is cooler because it shows off the machining and machining itself is a high end thing, um, because it's expensive. So showing that off, I think is better than just covering it all up and just blasting it away. Cause I think, I think that it, it can kind of cheapen it, even though it's consistent, even though it, I think actually blasted finish is nice. I think when, you have a high-end razor. I think it actually kind of lowers it a little bit, in my opinion. One thing I want to mention before we get to the next uh, question. I hope everybody appreciates his candor because it's 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 not normal to hear somebody <laughs> speak with candor, e- even saying things that exposes little 
I don't want to say secrets or sort of uh, inside baseball. And I certainly appreciate that. And he just kind of calls it like he sees it. And uh, I've been surprised by some of the responses this evening because, you know, from a business perspective, sometimes when you say things like that, people, you know, either turn them off or whatever. But on the same token, if you're transparent, uh, I think that's the way to go. And clearly you are. But some of the things you've said tonight, I'm sure some people will will not, uh, um, they, they probably would have had a uh, wish for a better answer or some other answer, but it is the answer. So I like that sort of candor. Yeah, I think that, I think that people, I tried to treat customers and, and, and viewers in this case, like the way that I like customers, the way I like to be treated. And I see through bullshit, like immediately. Maybe that's because I own a business, but like anytime people come on and talk about like how difficult it is to do whatever they're making, like we're making razors here. It's not that hard. Um, it's running a business is hard. And, um, but like there's no need to lie because people aren't dumb and people will see through bullshit. And so I like people who are, who are honest and forthright and like, I don't like people who are honest and forthright in a mean way. Like that's not cool, but I don't think I do that. I just try to be honest about my own things and, um, and people want answers. I give it to them because ultimately like anybody could go out there and start a razor company. Um, and a lot of people do. So like, it's not like I'm giving away any trade secrets here. You guys can all figure this out. Um, (laughs) but like, are you willing to sit there and dump, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in like your life for the next five, six years to build into an appreciable business. That's the question. The answer is probably no. So I'm yeah. not too worried about it. Um, but yeah, I try to be <laughs> as honest as possible. And people like it, you know. Oh yeah, um, yeah. For I the do. most part, uh, I'm I'm a fan, but I do realize that some some people aren't. They they like I'm sugar okay coating. You know, they like. Um, but I always like. You know, I like to hear it as as it is. So, is the era sure. meant to replace the dart? No, it didn't. So. I see how you could see it that way. I will say that um, the dart was going to die either way. It just wasn't working very well. We don't lose money on it, but when something isn't moving and it has a bad reputation, or at least a cloudy one like the dart did, um, it's a kind of a stain on your reputation as a brand. And so even though we're not losing money on it, it's also not helping us look better because you go read reviews on it. People are like, oh, it's the most aggressive thing in the world. It tore my face off. And, other people are like, oh, it's mild and stupid and I hate it. And it just doesn't help. Even if like, you know, we made money on that, but not enough to justify losing face. Um, so gotcha. the era, the era was going to happen either way, but I don't know what would have happened if the dart had performed well and the era had happened because they do overlap in price point and it becomes kind of awkward down there. So I don't know what would have happened then. I actually think the dart so, would have done a lot better if we priced it at like 180 or something. I think the dart would have probably, probably right. sold. Uh, yeah. I got to ask, because this is something that sometimes we talk about. So you can have a razor that I have a a razor up here that costs 28 cents, literally came from China, (laughs) 28 cents shipped. It was sent to me with the invoice and it shaved (laughs) just fine. And so you, you can get a shave off a stick, like you said before, which is basically what that thing is. And actually it wasn't bad. But something that I don't think we, some of us talk about it, but it's never completely understood is so when you invest in, in something that you really appreciate, even if it's just hold it, to look at it, the way it feels in your hands, when you're using it, there's a certain amount of enjoyment that comes from maybe a design that appeals to you or maybe just the way it shaves. I mean, again, razors have been around forever. You can get a shave, a great shave, or you should be if you're skilled enough with almost anything. But there is something to the premium razors in terms of enjoyment. Even when you get the package, you open it, it it feels good sometimes to have something like the Blackbird or the Vector. And, you know, for me, there there is value in the appreciation of the product. It's not just simply, I can get a shave with a 28 cent, cent razor. I have, I did it two weeks ago. I mean, it's no problem, can be done. But it's not as enjoyable as using the Blackbird. Hey, does For that sure. make sense? No, that's definitely correct. There's also a lot of like psychology here at play where um, when people spend more on things, it, you have to, like, it's, it sounds manipulative or bad, but it, it's just true. And it's, I'm, I don't think it has to be manipulative, but when you buy something that's expensive, 
you have an immediate sense that like it must be worth the amount I spent on it. And so mm-hmm. you already you already You're have invested. a high opinion of it before you even gotten it. Um, whereas if you buy the cheaper thing, you come into it with like more skepticism. If you buy the expensive right. thing, there's like a bunch of research on this too that shows that people will kind of convince themselves that they love something just because they spend a lot of money on it because otherwise mm-hmm. they would feel That's like an true. idiot. Otherwise you feel like an idiot for spending a bunch of money on something that does just as well as your 28 cent razor. So there's like this cognitive, um, I don't know if cognitive bias is the right word for it, but there is definitely a bias that happens there that um, impacts people. But also it's just nice to have nice things um, to that feels but, good in the hand. Know, and, for me, yeah. so if you're going to pay whatever the the Blackbird costs, what is it, 185? I don't know. I can't remember. It. It's going to go up a little bit here in the next few weeks, but um, yeah. So if you pay that and it's stainless steel or titanium, even if you buy the more expensive version, that razor should last well into your grandkids' kids. For sure. Um, if you remotely take care of it. So for me, the, the investment in that for something that if it's, re, if it's cared for at all, because we, I have a razor that's an ABC razor that's from, you know, early 1900s, still just fine. We have many, yeah, many old razors that weren't made nearly as well, perhaps in terms of the materials still hanging around. So it's, is that price stretched out over? So I'm expecting to pass these down to somebody. Like I, I don't, you know, they're going to outlast me without question. Sure. And so I don't have a problem with when you're spending money on something like a razor that's going to last basically forever or at least outlast you. Yeah. I do, however, when I look at a, a shaving soap that's $75 and I know that is not going to last, it's a little more difficult for me to, to get there on that. Uh, but you know, but, it's, all, it's all relative, Chris, because like, we, yeah. you know, people will go comment on an hey. era uh, post and they'll be like 75 bucks for a razor. What the hell? And fair enough. You know, yes. you can't, you can buy a razor that shaves well and will last you 20 years for 30 bucks. You know, like, you, you can, can do absolutely that. Absolutely can. Um, mm-hmm. So it's all relative. Like for us, you know, we go, Oh, 75 bucks is a reasonable price for something that's made in the USA. It's like all stainless steel, blah, blah, blah. Um, for someone else, they just go 75 bucks. Like, the hell. Um, that's true. Though, that That's like, that's a dinner and a, you know, that's like cheapish dinner and a movie. Um, so I don't know. It's not, <laughs> well, yeah. It's not yeah um, if you, if you go to a movie, even a matinee, if you got popcorn and whatnot, it's $40 for <laughs> yeah, you and your wife. It's rough. So that's yeah. just for a matinee. So yeah. if you put that against a stainless steel razor or any razor for that matter, it's really not that much. If it's something you're going to use and get enjoyment out of, that sure. was the point I was getting. Um, can you print totally it titanium? The answer is yes, and we uh, hope to. So we can print, well, we, I'd say we, like I do anything. Um, the 3DO can print in all sorts of metals, or will be able to. But they're focusing, though, you know, as a startup, they're focusing on their core competency, and they want to stick with the thing that will um, help drive them forward. So they're, you know, a funded, VC-funded startup, and so they're trying to focus on, they pick one material, 17-4 stainless steel, because it works really well in a lot of things. It works well for firearms, it works well for medical industries, and it helps them develop their technology and get a jump, like get a quick start. Um, but over time, we expect to be able to print in aluminum, titanium, um, Econel, or Inconel, whatever that word is, I always forget, um, and other, other, uh, other alloys. So we should be able to print in all sorts of stuff eventually. I don't know that we will, but we could. Whiskey or wine? Ooh, um, shit. Whiskey. Yeah. It's tricky. Whiskey. whiskey. I, don't, I don't drink, I don't drink much. Very, I don't, I love whiskey. I get a lot of it. I used to be, you know, I used to drink more of it when I was like in my early twenties and got into it. Um, but now like stuff just sits on my shelf for years, which I love because every once in a while I go sip it and there it is. I actually had a little bit of this tonight. Uh, I got it for my birthday. It's mirrored. So it's hard to tell. Um, I think it's from Texas. It's called Smooth Ambler. It's a weeded bourbon. Yes. That might no, be it's smooth guy. ambler from West Virginia, I believe. That's a West Virginia. Yeah, you're right. Actually, um, yeah, yeah, it sure is. Yeah, my buddy got it for me for birthday. Cool, good stuff. Yeah, I don't um, know. Like, from to, here like, in the West good Virginia. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, so you know it well. Well, uh, it's a it, it was no, a heck of a coincidence there. 
Well, you offer the vector <laughs> with an option for more efficiency and aggressive. Wow, somebody's really wanting you to bring it. I, I doubt it. Um, because options are annoying from a um, offering standpoint. They, like we talked about already, the wholesale thing, that's annoying. Um, and also the, the vector is already, yeah, I hate it's to use pretty word. Efficient. It's pretty, it's also pretty perfect as it is. And if you need it to be more aggressive, then use the Pro Super. And the Pro Super gives you more blade exposure. And if you need to be milder, then use a guarded blade. Like that's why we don't offer a bunch of different versions of the vector because it seems kind of dumb to because blades are to do that for you with the Artist Club. Like what people don't, always understand is that artist club blades which by the way our new website makes more clear but artist club blades vary in performance way more than than de blades do people think de blades vary in performance and like i'm not going to say they don't but it's like the difference between you know like a, a, <laughs> like a Syrah and a cab saw You're like oh i can tell the difference like subtly but like artist club blades vary like a champagne to a cabernet you know like it's mm -hmm massively different. You have a very mild razor blade and a super aggressive one all in the same razor. And so you let blade choice, um, let blade choice be your adjustable factor for the gotcha. vector. And if the pro super and the vector doesn't get you there, you need like a straight razor or something. I, I, I don't know how to help you. So just incredible says for the upcoming blackbird T I drop any advantage polished more glide or the same. Um, I'll answer from my perspective. Please. My perspective is and will remain always, unless they put a rover coating or something that creates drag. If you have drag on a finish, you need to work on making your lather slicker because you should not experience a ton of drag um, with I'm glad a razor. That. Like, it's it just I, I hear that and I'm like, if if the lather slick, you shouldn't be because mostly you know, you're allowing the blade access to the face and there's a little metal there touching it. It shouldn't be a tremendous amount of drag unless there's a coating that's bad. Now, your expert yep. opinion. That was my ignorance that is, opinion. That is my expert opinion. Uh, that's exactly <laughs> it. I, but I also think that with the Blackbird in particular, what a lot of people interpret as drag is actually the base plate and or the blade just removing all the lather. And so, like, you scrape off that lather, and then there's no slickness left because the base plate is um, too engaged with the skin. And so you're pulling that all off, and then you don't have very much left. Um, of course, like, people are right that polished, a polished finish should reduce drag, right? You're reducing surface area. That's all polishing is. And so you should have less drag. But in a real world, like you said, like, you're talking about, like, like maybe if you were in a lab, it's fractions. Out, yeah. It's so small that like, I just don't think it matters practically. I've done a bunch of blind shaves and like, I'm a, I'm worse at shaving than you guys are. Um, so I'm, I'm not the best tester, but I can't tell the difference. You know, my dumb face can't tell really. So get the polish if you think it's pretty. Otherwise don't. Um, says what makes the shave from the ear unique? Anything notable about comfort or efficiency compared to your competitors? I will say based on very, very limited use, what I came away with, and you'll see it tomorrow, is smooth. That's what sort of struck me is like, I'm looking for some way to describe this. It's smooth. There's no roughness to it. That's I'm going to turn on some lights. Sorry, so I'm going to walk around real quick. Yep. Um, yeah, so I could agree more with that. Um, it's definitely the blade clamping is unparalleled. Like, you really can't clamp a blade better than we do with the era. So there's that for people who are into that. Um, it's also basically uncloggable and it's just really smooth and nice, like you said. So a lot of smooth razors out there. Sorry, guys. Oh, God. Broke my thing. Okay. There's a lot of smooth, good razors out there. And the era is another one of them and maybe better in that way. <laughs> but I don't know. Oh, this question. Which one? Next question. Would you rather impregnate a horse and have a centaur child? Ooh, I like this. Or a okay. snake and father a snake boy? Oh, oh man. <laughs> well, <laughs> hang on. So the snake is a boy, but the centaur is just a child? <laughs> no. It comes from the madness that is V. Lou. So there's, there's no telling on that one. I Let's think see. Centaur, Here's... centaur is way better, for sure. Yeah, centaur, probably. Without um, will there be more polished uh, TI Blackbirds asking for a friend, Andre from yeah. Lancaster? 
podcast. Yeah, so there's actually never been any, um, but we'll be having them for the first time. Uh-oh, we lost audio again. Yeah, oh, sorry, I had to back. turn my, cool. my camera. Um, Man, there are the, a lot of questions here. I know. <laughs> they keep popping up. The uh, The Blackbird Titanium will be polished when they drop. So keep an eye out for a newsletter over the next like, few weeks. We'll probably open pre-orders for that really soon because they're about to start production, and production on them is actually pretty quick. Um. This question says, when you make TI versions of a previous design, do you ever refine the design? Punch it up a little bit. Well, it's only happened twice. So, no. Um, because people don't want Quick it question. Diff- yeah. You sent me, probably when you first started, the um, Blackbird. And I like that razor, but I thought at the time, the edges might have been a little bit sharp in some areas. Did you change that? Because I was almost sure, as I tried it later, that it, it it felt more refined. I don't remember which version. Well, there's not a version. I don't remember when exactly you got your first one. Very early on, they had sharp corners, and we basically just rounded those out. So like, it was early not, on. Yeah. Um, the very, very early ones had that, and we changed that pretty quickly, and the Blackbird hasn't changed since. So basically, all gotcha. we do is... Um, we just round out those corners a little bit and then the safety bar gets like basically hand finished to round that out, soften the edge a little bit. You don't need to do much. We just have to take off the, that very sharp point. So we don't want to change the geometry. We just kind of soften that up a little bit. Um, but we don't change anything for any of the titanium razors because people don't want them changed. They want the titanium version of that razor. So Taylor Alejandro has a question and I've been mentioning Kim a lot. And I also wanted to mention Taylor. Taylor's undergoing Taylor. some treatment, yeah. treatment for um, cancer. He just started, and so thoughts and prayers to you, Taylor. And if you have good vibes and thoughts and prayers to send, please send us send them to our friend Taylor. He's been around a long time. He's a great guy. And so Taylor, now to your question: What are your when you prototype? What is the process for using materials before you decide to make it in more expensive materials? I think that was his question. Uh, we kind of hit that earlier. Um, but we do just mostly 3D printing. Um, and then, honestly, at this point, so I actually have made th- prototypes in aluminum before because that's cheaper and easier. Um, but it's not that expensive just to do it in stainless since we have you know connections and stuff now. And um, it's not that much money. So we get really close with 3D printing and then more and more advanced 3D printing um, that we spend a you know, bit more money on. And then we just kind of jump into stainless and there might be kind of two iterations of that, but it doesn't take much. Will there ever be a truly aggressive Blackland safety razor? Um, <laughs> from my perspective, there's several that are pretty efficient as it is, but... Yeah. And I also think that, like, the uh, like aggressive is such a such a tough word. Um, it is. There's a new, new website they're building. It has a whole new um, system for rating the shaves. And instead of calling it like right now, it's just rated one to ten aggressiveness, and that's a terrible mm-hmm. system um, because aggressiveness covers harshness, safety, um, efficiency, smoothness, and it all kind of pretends it's one thing, but it's really not. Um, so, like a razor, like the Blackbird, where it's super efficient, but it's not really that risky for nicks and cuts. It's not very harsh. So, what is that? Is that like a ten because it's most efficient, or is that a three because it's not very um, there's not very many nicks or cuts? I don't know. So seven, I guess. And that rating is really just meant to kind of tell the user kind of what to expect. Oh, it's on the mid aggressive side of things. Great. I um, think that's. I kind think of what the, people the are looking for mostly when they re- refer to aggression, it's usually blade feel. How much blade feel am I getting? And then yeah. efficiency sort of different like you know but like also the way you use a razor can can make it feel rougher or more more mild depending on how you do it because if you take a straight razor just the easiest way to explain it is and if you hold if it's like this and you're going down this way it's going to feel rough as hell if you keep it very tight to your face not so much yep so new system ranks every razor and every version in four different categories with uh efficiency blade feel smoothness ah, that's good and and weight because weight's a super important factor as well and of course like the weight is 
we I rank it out of ten, even though it has like an actual you know uh, quantifiable mm -hmm. number in grams. Um, so having those four systems allows people to kind of figure out like, okay, this one's super efficient and not quite as smooth or this one, you know, whatever. And they can kind of figure out what their priorities are and it tells a more complete story, I think. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my thinking there. Yeah, oh, okay. So Taylor, who's from, I, I think Taylor lives in Kentucky, but he claims Ohio. Um, I think he lives in yeah I think he lives in Cincinnati or right around there Shane, either side of the border. I think he claims Ohio, but I thought he <laughs> lived in actually in Kentucky, right border type area. Sure. Shane, are you one of those always in the left hand lane at all times? Because you're from Ohio, and we oh, know what God, happens no. in Ohio. So first of all, I'm not from Ohio. I actually had a massive. Oh, well, I thought you were Ohio. No, I lived there. Um, okay, so you lived there. That's good enough. Yeah. So I'm back in. I live now in like downtown San Diego, um, but we previously lived in San Francisco, and then before that, we were in Ohio, before that, Indiana, and then before that, California. So we've gone the whole loop. Um, well, did you notice people staying in the left-hand lane at all times while thin Ohio? I notice it every day here. Uh, okay. I notice it everywhere I go. It's horrible. It's my yeah. least favorite thing in the world. Um, no, it, the, the rule is this. You pass on the left, you drive on the right, and if you need to be in the left lane, you do so as long as you need to be there, and then you get back. That's it. There is no other or end of discussion. It doesn't matter if you're the only car on the road for 100 miles. I don't care. Don't be in that lane unless you there need you to go. be. What razor would you recommend for lead, leg shaving? You may be experienced oh. on that. Maybe not. I don't Vector, know. for sure. Oh, that's a good choice. Yeah, yeah because it's, it's a light, good choice for anything. It's long and it covers a lot of um, surface area because it's wide, and so you can get a lot done, which is nice. And you can use a milder blade. Um, the lightness of the head is conducive to head and leg shaving because, like, just kind of fatigue, right? Like you're shaving your legs; it's like far away, and you have to do it for a long time. You don't want a big, heavy head; you can't control the pressure of. Um, so for sure. Right. After you really, uh, well, to live in we already we covered that one already, which is about when would vectors be available again. I think we've finally gotten through most of the questions uh, there. So, what else would you like to leave people with this evening? Mm -hmm. Obviously, first we'll say the the era, which again, keep on my channel. I'll be using it quite a bit here in the the next little bit to try it out and really see if I can you know, discern anything special about it. The first video tomorrow, um, it was a great shave. Cool. Honestly, most razors you try, it's rare to get a bad one. So you should expect that yeah. anything that comes out of most places that are, are going to be pretty good. Um, but I know you want to talk about the era, um, but what, what else uh, is coming or what do you want people to know? Um, I think we covered it pretty well. You know, people can, uh, I'm not a good salesman. Go follow, go follow us if you if you're interested. We uh, we share a lot of stuff. We'll have a new website coming out that'll be super functional and a lot better than we currently have. So keep an eye out for that, I guess. Um, and we'll, I don't know Blackland's in a really kind of big growth state right now where I'm just, it's a lot of behind the scenes work. Um, so next year should be should be interesting. Um, we'll finally have everything back in stock over the next few months, which is cool. Vector, Blackbird, Titanium, all the all the hits, and then um, we'll pop, oh, we'll also have some accessories coming, um, soap, aftershave, uh, that kind of thing. Those are all those are all in the docket, as well as um, leather, like a cool dot bag that we're designing, a really really cool one, and um, some like leather, some like razor pouches and stuff like that, accessory lines, and uh, and then here in the next few months, oh, uh, over the next few months. I will, I will put out a call for this. If you are out there, ideally in San Diego, but I guess you don't have to be, we're going to be looking for customer service people. And uh, if Ooh. you are a knowledgeable shape type person, that's even better. So if you could use some extra money, we pay well. Um, don't pay anyone less than 20 bucks an hour. So if you are interested in a job and uh, probably in Q1 or Q2 of next year, we could use you. So, uh, Touch base if you're interested in that. Ideally, Southern California. That's cool. Um, or at least can you know show up occasionally in person. 
I like to meet the people in person I work with, but not every day. Um, so there's that. And, uh, oh, and we're also in the next year might be adding a, um, might be adding a polishing service. So that might be coming as well. So you might be able to, uh, cause we're taking our polishing is in house now, but currently I do it and that's a terrible long-term business idea. So yeah, we, that's um, not a good use of your time. <sighs> yeah, it sucks. And I hate doing it, to be honest. <laughs> I've gotten pretty good at it, which is nice, but I hate doing it. Um, and yeah, not a great use of time. But um, outsourcing just wasn't working anymore. So we brought it back um, months ago. But um, we'll be, that allows us to polish up titanium blackbirds and all that stuff. But we're also going to be offering it to, you know, if you, once we hire for it and hire probably a couple of people for that, once you, you can send in a razor and we'll be able to polish it for you. Blackbird, Blackland, or otherwise. Um, so that stuff's coming. Um, but there's no action items you guys need to do. You know what to do. Just hang out and uh, you'll hear a word from us when we have stuff to sell. And just uh, be patient because we're working on getting everything back in stock. And uh, the vector will be coming, I, I promise you. God, we get so <laughs> many emails on that thing. I swear it's crazy. There are people I, laying in wait. It's nuts right yeah. now. And like people, um, and again, when you get it, you'll be happy with it. I don't find very many people that don't enjoy it. I mean, you might happen across one here and there, but it really is. Rare. A, Everyone likes it. Yeah, it's, it's, I think, um, because of the decision to keep it slim, you know, that's really, it makes all the difference. And then the yeah. overall, even everything just works with it. It just feels right. So it's one of those things that, it was just right from the beginning and it just, it works. It's a, it's nice and efficient, but most people can use it because it's, um, it's in that range where it can be nice and efficient, but not too efficient. Yep. And like you said before, you can throw a pro in there if you want to and for sure up it a little bit. I, I think the, the only complaint that I've ever heard about it is sometimes when people take it apart, they don't know how to put it back together because the pieces are, they're used to DEs. Uh, and they go, oh, which they, they get it flipped and I'm like, which which goes where? And I'm like, well, I always say the rounded parts to the back, folks. Rounded, these rounded corners always go to the back. That's how I remember it. But I have had yeah. a couple of people that, you know, like, oh, which, <laughs> that's it. What, that's once it. you, um, yeah, it, there's, if you actually look at it, there's only one way it can go. Um, <laughs> you can technically put it together the wrong way, but it doesn't make any sense when you do. Um, so, think about the way the the thing works together. We'll also have a, if you go back in, this is my fault for not having this more obvious on our current website, but the new website has a very clear like, instructional video on that. Um, oh, there goes my wife. Um, where if you go back to July in our, um, in our Instagram, you'll see a video of like assembly and that's like the best way to do it for sure. But we have a new video of that coming out and when the website drops next week. So I'll make it more clear how to assemble it. It's not that hard, people. Um, no, it, kinda, it, it's it's not. I, get it. I think it's what they do is but... turn it, turn, For turn sure. it the wrong way, then the mismatch it that way. Because I, I know yeah. someone told me they did that, and I was like, well, here, here's the way I think of it. And it's just you can see on the back that it's rounded back there, and so you just I just match those those up, and it's never a problem. And we we're ready to go. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. I really appreciate appreciate your time. Thanks for sending this for me to test out. I will say the first run was quite good, and I'm sure cool. it's going to get better over time. It looks poor. To, I started out with the open comb. Uh, I'll be using, you know, one of these next. It is, as you can see there, there's, you know, there's, like you said, it would be pretty hard to clog it probably. So it's we'll, basically impossible. I've tried. I, I won't say it's, if you I, say I, I impossible, it's someone will do it. I know. And they'll send your picture before, up. and they're like, ooh. Okay. Yeah. If you shave like a, a dog, you might clog it, but it's really <laughs> hard. <laughs> it's, it's hard. You have to, you have to try. But thanks for having me, Chris. I appreciate it, man. Have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. And thanks to all of you. I really appreciate it. Hope you all have a great evening. We'll see you next time. God bless. Right. Thanks guys.